Welcome to the USIA podcast. I'm Ian Bott. Dr. Ellen Langer is a professor of psychology at Harvard University, as well as the first female professor to be tenured in psychology at Harvard. Dr. Langer received her PhD in social and clinical psychology from Yale and studies the illusion of control, decision-making, aging, and mindfulness theory, and has often been referred to as the mother of mindfulness. If you enjoy this conversation, please subscribe to the channel for more conversations with leading thinkers. And without further ado, here is my conversation with Dr. Langer. Dr. Langer, welcome to the podcast. My pleasure. So we're discussing mindfulness today, and you've certainly been a pioneer in research in this area. Uh, so what do we mean by mindfulness? How okay. do we define it? Yeah. Well, it's interesting. Many people confuse what I do with meditation, although I did some of the early work on meditation. And meditation isn't mindfulness. Meditation is a procedure you go through in order to uh, achieve post-meditative mindfulness. Mindfulness, as we study it, is more direct. It's so simple, it actually defies belief when you pay attention to the um, outcomes of many of our studies. All it is is active noticing. When you notice novel things about the things you thought you knew, you come to see you didn't know it as well as you thought you did. So your attention naturally goes to it. So this active noticing is um, puts you in the present, makes you sensitive to context and perspective. It's in essence, it's the way we become engaged with things. And it turns out that it's energy begetting, not consuming. So we make people more mindful in a host of different situations by showing them essentially they don't know what they think they know, um, which happens as you naturally just notice new things. And what happens is uh, the neurons start firing and it turns out that it's literally and figuratively enlivening. And when you're actively noticing, people see you as more charismatic, trustworthy, relationships improve, memory improves, it's the essence of innovation. And when people are mindful, they're, they're seen as charismatic. Uh, not only that, but uh, you know, so it has these wonderful health effects. You ex basically wear it, you know, so people know when you're there. And uh, when you're mindful, you leave the imprint of your mindfulness on the products you produce. So you end up producing better products. And we have 40 years of research on, on uh, all of this. Um, it's, it's very exciting because it's very available to everybody. Now, around the globe, people are taught uh, to try to reduce uncertainty. And you can't reduce uncertainty because everything by its nature is uncertain. Everything is always changing. Everything looks different from different perspectives. And when you know you don't know something, then you naturally tune in. So there are two ways to become more mindful. One is this act of noticing, so you see you didn't know it, and then your attention naturally will go there. The other is if you can adopt the, the understanding that you don't know. So when I give lectures on this, I often start by asking people a simple question. Uh, let's say, how much is one in one? Now, everybody thinks they know how much one in one is, so they dutifully say two but it turns out one in one isn't always two. If you add one pile of snow to one pile of snow, one plus one equals one. Um, one watt of chewing gum plus one watt of chewing gum, one plus one equals one. So in the real world, rather than the world of abstractions, one in one probably doesn't equal two as often as it does. So that when you're aware of, um, you know, of this, uh, you have to pay attention to the context to see the particular answer at that moment in time. Right. And, and in your book, Mind, Mindfulness, I think you really go into the details about all the benefits associated with becoming more mindful. And, and you seem optimistic. And, you know, you describe that you believe that we are in the midst of a, of a revolution in consciousness. Why or, or an evolution, either one. Right. Why do you believe this to be the case? Well, because um, once people become more mindful, there's no going back. You know, it's sort of like Plato's, uh, you know, in the cave, once you're out of the cave and, uh, or what is the old uh, song? Uh, How can you keep them down on the farm after they've seen Paris? So because it's so easy and it feels good. And what happens is that when you're mindful, you notice opportunities to which you'd otherwise be blind and you avert the danger not yet arisen. So, um, and it's because of that, it, you know, it, 
if you look in the United States back, I guess it was in the 60s, and you have people thinking that black is beautiful as a way of getting rid of discrimination against blacks. And then Latinos, well, uh, being a Latino is beautiful and so on. And then everybody starts to realize that uh, there's a way of understanding whatever their circumstances so that it's a, it's a benefit. And so as that grows, um, uh, mindfulness itself will grow. But we have some new data that's wild that shows that mindfulness is actually contagious. So it's not just that um, you'll find me more attractive, but if I'm mindful, that will lead you to be more mindful. And so it can grow exponentially, which is why I believe that uh, we're on the verge of this evolution in consciousness. It, it does seem like more people uh, today than ever are, are interested in, in mindfulness and, and cultivate that. Um, in their lives. And at the same time, you know, I think it's, it's also, there's no shortage of, of mindless action. Uh, no, there's no, without question. In fact, 40 years of our research shows that virtually all of us are mindless almost all the time. So we have a, a way to go. Where do you feel like um, the, the rise of technology and, and social media fits into this? It, it, it seems like we've always had advertisers who are trying to sort of prey upon our, our mindlessness, but the, the scale seems totally different today with, with social media platforms. Um, do, do you see the advancement of technology as, as likely to facilitate or, or inhibit our capacity to be mindful? Well, it's interesting in that no matter what you do, you can do it mindfully or mindlessly with important consequences that result depending on which way you're doing it. So it doesn't matter if you're giving a podcast, playing golf, eating a sandwich, or doing some social media or using your computer in some other way. It can be mindful or mindless. Um, I think that uh, now that people have a great facility with computers, they're unlikely to uh, increase one's mindlessness. Uh, mindlessness. You know, in the past when you didn't know what you were doing and so you use the computer almost as if you were blindly following a recipe while you were in the kitchen. Um, but um, I think that the technology provides great opportunity to um, enhance people's mindlessness, but I don't think that it's accomplished it yet. You know, that uh, you have access to lots of information, but if that information leads you to believe, um, you know, to take in the information in a single-minded way, it's just going to promote more mindlessness rather than mindfulness. And, you know, we had studies from way back when where we simply took textbooks and what we did was to make the textbooks more mindful. That means they went from absolutes to conditional language. So instead of here are three reasons why computers are good, it would say here are three reasons from Ian's perspective uh, that computers may be good. You know, so the same content, but, but not quite the same. And all over the globe, people um, teach people these absolutes. And when you think you know something in any absolute form, there's no reason to pay further attention to it. So whether it's in a college classroom, or elementary school, um, books you're reading, or with the computer, that anything that leads you to believe, ah, now I have it, now I know one and one is two, um, is going to uh, lead you to be more mindless. Hmm. And, and as you point out that, that being mindful requires us to let go of seeing the world in, in absolute categories. Um, I'm, I'm wondering how this might relate to um, some of the, the divisiveness, the, the polarization that we're seeing in today's political climate. Do you think that this is a function of our inability to perceive nuance and, and to hold multiple perspectives simultaneously? Um, I don't think we have an inability to perceive nuance. I think we've been taught to look for these absolutes. And so no matter what question is asked, whether it's a sophisticated question or a simple question, as in the one plus one is two, people seek single answers and then think they know, and then that's the end of the game for them. So when we start turning things around and we get people to come up with multiple answers to individual questions, we, we start um, um, making people more mindful. But you know, the, um, the powers that be get to stay in power 
because of um, the mistaken assumption that they know, you know, and you know, you don't know if they're acting like they know, well, then they should be in charge. Um, and so uh, I, I think that what we need to do is bottom up, top down, whatever it is to get people to understand that in general, behavior makes sense from the actor's perspective or else the actor wouldn't do it. And when you have a simple thing like that, you tend not to line people up from um, worst to the best. You know, that uh, if you're inconsistent, I don't feel superior. Um, I recognize that inconsistent means you're just being flexible and so on. So there's an oppositely valenced but equally potent alternative to all of the names we call each other. And um, if we can learn that, then I think um, there'll be less in-group fighting. But I think the position we're in right now is largely because of the unequal distribution of resources. You know, that um, I don't know that it's a function of mindlessness or mindfulness per se. Uh, but I know that um, if you can keep people from thinking, uh, thinking of alternatives, thinking of how they could succeed, um, then you're likely to keep your place on top more easily. Right. Possibly. And, and, absolutely. And, and, and given that there are so many positive traits and qualities associated with mindfulness and the research has shown that, um, why is it that, that mindlessness develops and, and what can we do to cultivate becoming more mindful? Okay, well, you know, I think that, uh, as I've just said, and this is a guess on my part, but that it maintains the power structure, right? Everybody is where they're supposed to be. Um, and when you recognize that, you know, your scores on a test are only a function of uh, the particular questions particular people asked at a particular time, not because you're less able, um, you know, so if you buy it all, then you just stay a C student throughout life. If you realize, hey, you could be an A student. I mean, this is true for everything. And so when I play tennis, I'm fond of this example. Um, and I'm a good tennis player, not great by any means. But um, I question who decided it's only two serves. Mm -hmm. So my first serve, I kill it and it doesn't go in. My second serve, because I'm playing doubles as a wuss, it's terrible, but it goes in. If there were three serves, so my first one I'd hit really hard, it wouldn't go in, I'd learn from that. My second serve would also be hard because I still have the backup third serve. And so the point is that if I designed the game, I would be a better tennis player. So, it, you know, and the point is that for each of us, no matter what we're doing, the more similar we are to the person who created the rules, the easier the game is going to be for us, literal game or you know, figuratively speaking. And that once people realize that everything is mutable, no matter what is, could be reshaped and uh, they could reshape it better uh, to better meet their own needs. So, um, and that would go a long way to making people more mindful. But the easy way is an answer to your question. So what do we do about all this mindlessness? Um, it, it's again, it's very simple. You know, that people need to, if you walk out of your house or stay in your house, notice three new things in the house. Walk out of the house, notice three new things. Go to the office, go, you know, to a restaurant when COVID passes, wherever you're going and just notice new things. And you say, gee, you know, this is all new. And so, and that noticing feels good. And so you keep doing that. You come to see over time that you don't know. And if you really recognize that uncertainty is the rule rather than the exception, then you naturally sit up and pay attention. I, I really like the, the tennis example and it, it made me wonder, uh, is there ever a reason to you know, maintain a sense of, of mindlessness in order to preserve a sense of stability and, and order. So um, I, I was a math teacher as an example, and you know, you want your students to question these things. A lot of times there, there aren't absolute categories that, that, you know, that's not the ultimate truth. Um, and yet in order to, um, you know, 
preserve a set of of norms and and and, and cultures like there is certainly it feels like there's a pressure to uh, rely upon these rigid. Well, no, so I I think that it's never good to be mindless. Hmm. You know, I think the in fact the only time it would be good to be mindless is if two conditions were met. One, uh, you found the very best way of doing something, and two, that nothing changed. Uh, otherwise, if you're going to do it, it's better to be there for it. Now, to be mindful doesn't mean you have to uh, not follow the rules. Um, if they don't make sense to you, it's good not to follow them. But, you know, um, I can use a, a pen as a pen. Um, but uh, that doesn't mean that if I needed, um, oh, I don't know, some tool rather than a pen that I couldn't use the pen in that other way, all right? But if I am brought up to believe that things are, you know, in, in some more solid, uh, unconditional way, then it doesn't occur to me to, to use them in different ways. There used to be a, a commercial for a V8 juice. Person would go to the refrigerator and they take orange juice and, ah, oh, I should have had a V8. And what mindfulness does is make all those choices available to you. So that, you know, when you're going to, in this example, the refrigerator, you know you don't have to have my, uh, orange juice, but that doesn't mean you can't have the orange juice. So you can behave in a very conventional way. But if the absence of convention would be to your advantage at any moment, uh, you're not going to be held back by your mindlessness. That, that makes sense. And I, I really like the, the directive to, to notice new things, right? Rather than just to be, be present, which doesn't really tell you, like, how do I actually Yeah, be... no, that, that instruction uh, I find amusing. It's sweet, but <laughs> it's, it's ridiculous. Um, you know, be in the present, smell the roses. That if you're not in the present, you're not there to know you're not there. So, um, you know, so you can't be in the present by instruction. The way to be in the present is this act of noticing. And as you notice new things, that necessarily puts you in the present. And then when you're there, you can take advantage of whatever opportunities are in front of you. Yes. And, and another thing I really um, in, liked uh, in the book, you said that uh, mindfulness can be a tool to get what we want. If we examine what we want, we can usually get what we want without compromising. Um, just, just to play devil's advocate, don't we live in a, a world with limited resources, uh, bounded by time? Like, how do we, how can we get what we want through mindfulness? Yeah, well, uh, you know, um, it depends on what we're going to call a resource. Mm -hmm. So we can certainly say that um, uh, resources are limited or that uh, life is zero sum, either you win or I win. But what we're actually seeking is a certain peace of mind happiness, um, you know, uh, self-respect, and everything we do is in the service of those needs. And those needs uh, can be met by all of us. So they're, they're not limited. And as far as just a general thing, I mean, your, your audience will probably go crazy when I say this, but, you know, when we say resources are limited, who, who said, who decides what's a resource? Right. You know, so just call more things resources, and then they're less limited. You'll get you'll get mail about that. And, and you've also examined our uh, relationship with aging. Um, I'm wondering how can we be mindful about aging, and and what exactly are our mindsets about old age? Yeah. Well, the problem is that most of us are taught what it means to be old when we're very young, thinking we're never going to be old. So if I tell you in that when you're older, you know, 20, 30 years from now, 40 years, how old are you? Uh, 30. Okay, so, you know, 50 years, <laughs> whatever it is, um, that you're going to be uh, forgetful, you're going to be weak, your body is going to just start to um, fall apart, you're not going to argue it. Because what do you care? In your mind, you're never going to get there. So you buy into that, you freeze that understanding. Then when you get older, and let's say you forget, um, what happens too frequently is that people then think, oh, this is the beginning of the end. You know, I, I'm getting dementia. When my guess is that you yourself, 30, uh, don't infrequently forget things. 
So you forget things, but you don't attribute it to um, to some big thing like um, uh, dementia. And uh, so there's that, there's the, the general sense that you're going to fall apart. So if you uh, hurt your wrist, what you'll do is take care of it, whatever that care in, um, involves. If uh, I hurt my wrist, I'm 73, and I have this mindset that you fall apart, I don't do anything because after all, what do you expect? You get older, you fall apart. Um, and so, you know, you can see how it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Uh, but we, you know, in the counterclockwise study, I don't know if you know that study, hmm. um, that we retrofitted a retreat to 20 years earlier and had old men live there as if they were their younger selves. And by being their younger selves, the, the results were phenomenal. Their hearing improved, their vision improved, their memory improved. They even looked younger. Hmm. And so, um, you know, uh, so we know that most of these uh, uh, diminutions in um, abilities and what have you can be reversed. I mean, at of, some point you probably do get old, old, who knows. Uh, but I think that the problems of aging have been greatly exaggerated. And, you know, it starts very early. We have, when you're young, you're seen as developing. When you get to a certain age, you know, in 10 years for you, now you're not seen as developing anymore. You're seen as aging. Mm -hmm. You know, and there should be growth throughout one's lifetime. Mm -hmm. the, the counterclockwise research I found really fascinating, the idea that it's possible to backtrack into a, a more yeah. uh, youthful state. Uh, and also, uh, just to switch, how do we, uh, how might we cultivate mindfulness uh, within the workplace? Uh, you are not um, an advocate of, of the term work-life balance, um, yeah. but how might we, like, why is this the case and how might we become more mindful about yeah. that? I'm, I'm glad that that somehow has gotten out there in the world. Uh, yeah, instead of work-life balance, work-life balance is better than work-life imbalance, uh, but much better is work-life integration. You should be the same person no matter where you are. And by having a notion of work-life balance, it suggests work has to be awful, work has to be stressful. Uh, work has to be something from which you need an, a vacation and so on. And if you're working mindfully, none of that should be true. Um, and, and this is one of the advantages of COVID and that so many people are working from home and you're working from home and your dog starts barking or you know, a child comes in. You know, it, it forces you to, to be in, in some ways more human. And um, I think that the idea that people should accept that life is stressful um, is, uh, is wrong. You know, stress is not a function of events. It's a function of the views you take of events. And there's always a view that one can take that uh, is not stressful. So if you did, you are stressed and stress requires two things. It requires a belief that something awful is, uh, that something is going to happen and that when it happens, it's going to be awful. And you can argue against both of those. So the first, that the belief that something's going to happen, even if you just ask yourself for three reasons, five reasons, the number doesn't really matter, that it might not happen, you go from thinking it's going to happen to realize, realizing maybe it will, maybe it won't. Then if you say to yourself, okay, let's assume it happens, what are the advantages? And there are always advantages. And um, by doing this, um, one gets to the point where, okay, you know, whatever happens uh, will be fine. You can't predict and you can cope with whatever it is because the whatever happens is again, neither positive nor negative. It depends on how we view it. You and I go out to dinner, the food is awful. Uh, that's great, I won't eat as much, hmm. right? No matter what, there are other views that one can take. And the more mindful you are, the more facile you become with generating these alternatives. Right, I think the, the, the need for work-life integration today uh, seems more important than ever because uh, work and home aren't necessarily separated by oh. physical locations, right? And, and um, you also mentioned COVID-19 and, and anecdotally, it seems like uh, a lot of people actually have, have been using this time to notice, you know, reprioritize, notice new things uh, about, um, you know, how they want to set up their life, right? Do you, do you have a right. sense of how COVID-19 might be impacting our, our sense of mindfulness? Oh, yes. I think, well, 
first, um, you know, the first effect was probably negative, everybody very stressed. And, you know, people don't like living in a negative state for too long. So they just go about their business. And many people become, who used to enjoy eating out and eating out is um, a little dangerous so that they've uh, taken to cooking. And, you know, if you're going to be cooking a lot, you realize life doesn't, uh, isn't made or broken on any particular meal. So you're easier about everything that can generalize to other things as well. Cooking itself is creative. You can't, Stores don't have quite as much of variety as they used to have, and it's hard to get uh, many of the things. So you find yourself substituting for things. Maybe you come to realize that these recipes were just other people's ideas of how to make whatever it is. And so you play with it. And um, the, the best of all possible worlds, but it won't happen for many people, is that you generalize these new tools to other things that you're doing. Um, I think that you know, um, people often get caught in a rut and they're doing what they're doing just because they've done it before that way. And now is an opportunity where everything is thrown, you know, thrown up in the air and you can pick and choose how to do many of these things. And you see that there were many things that you used to do that maybe you don't want to do anymore. You know, I used to, during summers, there were so many parties and, you know, the people are wonderful, but they were the same people at all of the parties. Mm -hmm. And, you know, um, and so you start to take it for granted. And now I reach out for people, you know, to people and I'm Zooming and talking on the phone to people. Um, and the conversations all tend to be real. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I think that uh, lots of people are doing things now uh, because they have an excuse. Well, it's COVID. And then you see when well, you enjoy it and it's OK mm -hmm. to let yourself binge on some silly TV show. I, I've been watching this series. I'm not going to tell you which one. Mm -hmm. Lawsuit possibilities. But mm -hmm. it is so dumb. <laughs> you know? I mean, it's really ridiculous, but it, it's fun. And, you know, and I, I just watch it and I, you know, I say, I, could you believe that, you know, but with every other action that happens, there's enough time to do the heavy, you know, thinking and reading and so on. And somehow the day is uh, the same more hours in the day because you don't have travel time and, and so on. This for a lot of people, there are advantage to all of this. And it's also, and this is gonna sound sort of hallmarking. Um, I, I don't have a more sophisticated way of saying it, but life only consists of moments. And if you make the moment matter, then it matters. It can't matter more. It's just a moment that either matters or it doesn't. And so uh, whether you're in the house, you're outside, it's COVID, it's not COVID, that um, there's a way that uh, I think life should be and could be made more meaningful for people by taking it, you know, in these, in these little bits. Um, and I think that maybe that'll be part of a lesson learned from COVID. Um, I've, I've certainly heard that and, and felt that, that you know, with these these external pressures, right, the, to do things the way they've always been done have, have been lifted to an extent during this time. And so it does seem to free us up to really pursue what is most meaningful to us. Yeah. And I, I hope we'll be able to, to continue to do that. Well, that's the question. The, the question is how many people will just fall back into what they did before? Mm -hmm. And uh, there'll be some subset, hopefully it'll be a large proportion, but who knows, that will... Uh, take all the lessons they've learned during this time and carry them forward. Yes, that'll be really interesting to, to see what happens there. Uh, one final question I had uh, is related to, to dualism. So often we hear mind uh, and, and body described as distinct from one another, but you've argued that this sense of dualism can be a dangerous mindset. Why do yeah. you think that's the well, case? Well, I, I think that... Um, uh, the question has always been, how do you get from this fuzzy thing called the thought to something real in the body? And I mean, nobody has been able to, to answer that. Um, 
the we have all sorts of fabulous work on placebos, for instance, where you tell yourself it's a real drug or you just presume it's a real drug and then you heal um, when it's not the drug at all. So you're doing it yourself. But for me, after many of these studies where we're making people more mindful and they're living longer, uh, which we have across four different uh, experiments. I said, mind, body, these are just words. Let's put the mind and body back together. And then wherever you're putting the mind, you're necessarily putting the body. And then we've done a host of studies that I don't think could have been derived from uh, a dualist notion. Um, the one we already talked about, the counterclockwise study was the first test of this. You put the mind and body back together. So we have these old men, now their minds are their younger selves. And we already talked about the results. We have many of these. Um, uh, and let me give you an example. Let's see, the, one of the diabetes studies. So we have people show up who have type two diabetes and they're gonna play computer games. And there's a clock next to the computer that um, uh, and they're told, um, change the game you're playing every 15 minutes or so. That's just to ensure that they'll look at the clock. The clock for a third of the people is going twice as fast as real time, mm -hmm. half as fast as real time for another third and real time for the third. And what we're asking is, does blood sugar level follow real or perceived time? And the answer is perceived time. We have people in a sleep lab who wake up and the clock again, I'm big on clocks, the clock was moved. So they think they got two hours more sleep than they got, two hours uh, fewer than they got, or the amount of sleep they got. And again, biological and cognitive functioning seems to follow perceived sleep. And the point of all of these, since we can control our thoughts, um, is that we have far more control, not just over our happiness and well-being, but what's taken to be our physical health than most people presume. Yes, I, I, as, as you mentioned, I think you say if the mind is, in a, is fully in a healthy place, then the body will be healthy as well. And it's really yeah. interesting to see the research that's supporting that. Um, well, for more on mindfulness, I, I very much uh, enjoyed reading your book, uh, Mindfulness, which I have here. Um, and I'd recommend that for, for listeners who are looking for a detailed analysis of what mindfulness is and, and what the research says about its potential to solve uh, many of the problems that we encounter in life. Uh, for those of um, us who would like to explore some of your work beyond this, where might they go? Well, it turns out my website just went down. It has to be rebuilt. <laughs> um, but I think that if you just Google my name, uh, lots of my books will uh, show up. And uh, people often ask me, so which should they read first? And they're like my children. You know, I, I don't have a favorite. But the mindfulness book that you just held up was a 25-year anniversary edition. Mm -hmm. uh, and after I wrote the original mindfulness book, I wrote uh, The Power of Mindful Learning. And then after that, on becoming an artist, reinventing yourself through mindful creativity. And that's really about interpersonal mindfulness. And then there's the counterclockwise book, which um, deals primarily with health. So that's a good start for people. Yes. And I, I think we'll, we'll aim to link some of those in the description. And I, I hope to check them out myself. Uh, Dr. Ellen Langer, thank you so much for being with us today to share My, your perspectives. My pleasure. Good to talk to you. Good to talk to you.